Welcome to Water of Life Online. We are so glad that you are tuning in for today's message. And you know, here at Water of Life, we believe in having passion for God and compassion for people. And so we're so glad that you're with us today. For more information about our church, from our service times, to the ministries we have available and more, you can check out our website at wateroflifecc.org. And of course, if you wanna stay connected with us throughout the week, make sure you follow us on our different social media platforms. Well, we're so glad that you're here. We hope that God speaks to you, that he encourages you, and we hope that you are blessed by today's message. my favorite moment with my dad. <laughs> I'm drawing my dad. Oh, this is my dad. This is a picture of my dad running for the ball. I'm drawing the rim of the basketball. Drawing this fish in the line. And then I'm gonna draw a smile. There's a football yeah. with the little Lines. Right. Don't judge my horrible drawing. <laughs> I think I'm gonna draw. Um... I'm gonna draw a picture of my dad and me sparring. It's like fighting in karate. What's my favorite thing about my dad? I like playing video games with him. When he like plays with me a lot. My dad's my favorite thing about my. Wait, what yeah. was the question? <laughs> He takes me fun places. He takes me fishing. He works really hard and he doesn't quit when things get hard. My dad's favorite food is he likes to eat the gittles with ketchup, cheese, and sour cream. Tortilla chips? Probably rice and chicken. <laughs> That's all I've ever seen him make. My dad's favorite thing to do is collect trading cards, like the basketball ones. Um, my dad lifts a lot of weight. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I know that my dad loves Jesus because he does Bible study with us sometimes. Because he reads the Bible in the morning. He always prays in the night. He usually kneels down. He's never late for church. He reads the Bible and prays. Puts his hands together on the bed and just starts saying words. My mom's favorite thing about my dad is well, he obviously uses my mom as a pillow, and in two seconds, he just falls asleep. Uh, she's married to him. Um, my dad's big and muscular. Oh, shoot. I don't really know. But he makes money. He takes care of the family. He cooks sometimes. picture of me and my dad catching fish. It's a picture of my dad reading a book to me and I'm in bed. This is a picture of me and my dad going fishing. So this is a picture of me and my dad just playing football at a park. This is a picture of me and my dad and we're holding hands. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day, Dad. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, fathers, if you're here, stand up, would you, so we can, uh, it's your day, man. We wanna say way to go. Now this, this stay up for a minute. This, this is a, a miracle. You gotta understand a miracle. Father's Day is the least attended day by men in church <laughs> at, all year. This is true, I'm telling you the truth. This is the truth. So I just wanna say I'm glad that you came to church today. So let me pray for you before you sit down. I wanna pray for you. Father, thank you for men. Now, I hope that as they listen to these kids talk, they understand how much influence they have, Father. 
what a difference they can make in a destiny and just putting their heart into your heart and then into their children's lives, Father. So I pray for them. Just thank you for men that have a heart for you and a heart for their family. I pray for them. You'd help them be steadfast, immovable, and to keep abounding in the Lord. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen, amen, amen. Way to go, guys. Okay, so we are doing Dollar Club this weekend, and we started last weekend, and so Dollar Club, if you're not familiar with it, is a place where we bless people around the world, and um, this is, Dollar Club is going to Cuba, so we have like a two-second thank you from Cuba, but also just want to tell you, if you want to do Dollar Club, if you weren't here last week, you want to do it, it's not too late to jump in, we're going to be feeding kids in Cuba that are hungry, so let's see if you want to show the video. That was it, man, that was fast. <laughs> that was it. But yay for Cuba, that was, I mean, that's important. And it's like, we can make a difference. Your dollars go a million miles around the world. And uh, I know you think they go a million miles at Starbucks, but really they don't. You, know, you can feed a kid from what you can have for coffee. So it's, uh, you can make a huge difference. So we always try to encourage you to do that. Generosity is your father's heart, right? It is God's heart to be generous. Father, we want to come to you right now. Say thank you, God, for your heart for us, that you're generous towards your church, towards your people, towards your bride, towards those people that you love and you've called your own. And so as we are here on Father's Day, we pray that you would reveal your heart as our Father to us today and that we would grab a hold of that and allow you to transform us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the kingdom of God. Thank you for your heart, for your people that you shepherd and you care for. Father, we pray as we open your word, Holy Spirit, you'd come and open up our hearts. In the name of Jesus, everybody said. uh, Okay, so we're gonna be in a bunch of different places today. Proverbs 23, uh, Matthew chapter four. But if you haven't been with us, this third part of a series we're doing on the kingdom of God and talking about the king and the kingdom. And most of us don't understand the kingdom of God. Like if we did a little survey here and we just said, tell me what the kingdom of God is. You would say, oh, it's the church. Oh, it's this thing. Oh, it's Jesus. Oh, what, what? But you really don't know what the kingdom of God is. And that's an amazing thing because when Jesus taught, all he taught was what was called the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. He didn't teach what we often teach today. He taught a whole different story. And so when you see the kingdom of God, you start to go, what happened here? How did we get disconnected from the king and the kingdom? So that's why we're doing eight weeks on the kingdom of God. So let's start with Jesus at the beginning of his ministry talking about the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter four, if you're at Upland or Townsville or online, we wanna welcome you. Happy Father's Day but not in Australia, because that was yesterday for them. And uh, so their Father's Day is already over in Australia. But if you want to read along with us online or one of our other campuses over at Upland, let's read loud and together from Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. It says, Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching everywhere the good news about the kingdom. And he healed people who had every kind of sickness and disease. Now, this is a staggering picture. I mean, it says that Jesus went about teaching what? The gospel, that's the good news. It says the good news about what? The kingdom. Now, how can you teach the good news about the kingdom if you don't know what the kingdom is? Hello? How many of you know this is an important topic? If this has started Jesus' life and his ministry, we ought to know what that's about. So when you start to talk about the good news about the kingdom, let's talk about two things that he, that he covered here. He always tied the kingdom to miraculous things. So he, it says he went about healing every kind of disease. And this is amazing, every kind of sickness and disease. So healing and the gospel, the kingdom always went together. So when we talk about what does the kingdom look like, it was Jesus making a statement, I am more powerful than hell and the world. I am more powerful than anything that could come against you. I am literally your king and your God. That's what the gospel of the kingdom is about. So when you start to look at this, and we talked last week about this, the message of the kingdom really has to do with the decisions we make. You know, how do you become part of the kingdom? You have to choose. You have to choose and choose and choose. Now, how how many of you know it's hard to be raised in America and want to choose somebody to be a king over you? (laughs) Most of you are like, no, thank you. I vote. No, no, no. In the kingdom of God, you don't get a vote. 
No votes in the kingdom of God. There's a king and there's a kingdom. And you get to choose if you want to be part of the kingdom. That's the kingdom of God. And that's the message of the kingdom. And so when we talked about this last week, we talked about the decision we make and how it shapes our destiny. Each one of them every single day, choosing God, choosing God, choosing God. Because we make statements like this, friends, we say, you know, I want you to be in my life, Lord. I want you, hold, hold it. What word did you use, Lord? What does Lord mean? Somebody who's over you. And so that's the picture of the kingdom of God. So we talked about that last week and we talked about how the kingdom of God is now, but it's not yet. It's here, it manifests here today. It touches, it hugs you. It sometimes heals you and does supernatural, miraculous things. And then Jesus was very clear, it's not until the end of time. Matthew 25, he says, enter into the kingdom that I have for you now. And so clearly the kingdom of God is here now, partially, but not yet fully. And so we talked about that last week because the Bible says, and we're gonna cover this uh, in Galatians 1, it talks about that you live in a present evil age. Anybody agree with that? Yes. And then there's the, the Bible references in Ephesians 1, an age to come, an age to come, where things are gonna be what? Better, 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 better. They're gonna, an age to come. And so what the gospel of kingdom is, when you get touched here on earth, you got some of the age to come, came into the present evil age, touched your life and changed you, even though you didn't recognize that. So let's talk about this today. Let's talk about your identity and the kingdom. Most of you think, oh, that, well, how could that even matter to me? Well, because if you are a child of a king, hello? The Bible says you are. That, 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 that's why you just sang that song like 55 times. I'm a child of God. You kept singing it over and over. I'm a child. We're trying to convince you. you. You're a child of God. That means you're a child of a what? Of a king. You're a child of a king. You're a child of a king. That makes you royalty. Now, you don't feel like it. I, I already know that. You're like, I don't feel like royalty. This isn't about how you feel. <clears throat> You're like, it needs to be about how I feel. No, no, no. No, it actually doesn't because your feelings deceive you. Have you ever noticed that? Your feelings trigger you. You cannot live it by faith and by feelings at the same time, friends. You've got to figure that out. There's going to be times when you're, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, your heart is more deceitful than all else. Who can know it? Your heart tricks you. Your feelings trick you. So what you have to do is you've got to know the word and you've got to be led by the spirit and then you will find that your life of faith is stable because you are grounded on the rock, not the quicksand. The quicksand, by the way, is your feelings because they come and they go and they change. Have you ever noticed that? Hello, yes, for all of us. They come and they go and they change. So let's talk about your identity in the kingdom of God. Proverbs 23, seven says this, for as a man or a person thinks of themselves, so they are. Hold, hold, hold it. As a person thinks of themselves, so they are. What does that mean? That means if you think, uh, listen, my mama told me I'm a loser, I'm a loser. Some of you, you know, you can laugh at that, but that is exactly what's happened to you. You know, somebody spoke into your life and spoke over you as a child. You're never gonna amount to anything. You're never gonna be worth anything. And you believe that. And you've actually allowed that to help shape your identity. And friends, whatever you believe about yourself, listen, as a person thinks of themselves, so you become. So if you know that you are a child of God and you live out of that, how many of you know that can change you? Now, 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 now it can change you for bad or good. Because I know a lot of Christians who don't ever surrender to the king, but act like they're children of him. Like, oh, God will do this for me and God will do that. That's called presumption. And, and see, that's not what the Bible teaches, friends. The Bible teaches submission. Hello, did you get what I just said? Not presumption. Submission and presumption are very different from each other. You know, submission is you yield your life to the king and then he gives you favor you don't deserve in places you should never have it. He does these amazing things for you. But presumption says, oh, I'm a child of, of this great king and watch me go. God's gonna take care of me all the time and you don't ever surrender to God. Well, friends, there's no authority where there's no submission. If you don't submit to God, then you're never gonna be recognized as a child of God. Does this make sense? Uh, okay, so let's keep going, but watch this. So if you're a child of the king, then, then the question you gotta ask yourself is how do you formulate your identity? 
Because the truth is most of us formulate our identity from the outside in. What does that mean? It means that's why you look in the mirror. Hello? You do look in the mirror. Please tell me you looked in the mirror before you came to church today. Okay, so, so, so you do look in the mirror. And when you look in the mirror, what are you thinking? Who, as, who am I? Who is this person? You know, what, this person needs some help today. Yeah, you know, you need to, yeah, take a shower, wash your hair. If you need to paint the barn, then paint it, it's better. And, you know, I'm playing, girls, I'm playing. No, no, but, but <laughs> I shouldn't have gone there. This is supposed to be Father's Day. Okay, so I'm playing with you. No, when you look in the mirror, you are making a decision about something that has to do with your identity. Most of us are. Your clothing, your car, your house, you shape your identity around, so many of us in, in this culture shape our identity around those things. You go to other cultures where they don't have houses and they, I mean, like big houses and it, it's not, it's just like shelter. I just need a shelter and I need a place to be protected. That Your house then isn't your identity. But in our culture, our house is often our identity. The neighborhood you live in shapes your identity. The car you drive. Some of you think, man, look at my car go. I am so hot. Really? Last time I checked, you were not your car. Hello? You are not your car. Someday your car is going to go to pick apart. No, I know that's hard for you to get your head around right now, but that is gonna happen. Your car is gonna go to the junkyard someday. So, so you are not your car. You gotta, you, th that's why the Bible says on judgment day, you stand alone before God. Because it's just you and him. This is, I mean, the Bible says that you should shape your identity from the inside out, not the outside in. So how many of you know that is a game changer. That's a complete game changer. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to do a whole transformation on your insides before you start to see yourself differently on the outside. Like if your car breaks down and, or, or you get in trouble, your company crashes and burns and you have to go you know, file bankruptcy, God forbid, but you do, and you file bankruptcy, and you have to get rid of your nice car, and you're gonna get, you know, it gets repossessed, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm a horrible person. I hear people say this to me. I'm a horrible person. You're a horrible person because you lost your car? H hello? No, because now I'm driving this piece of junk. I'm a horrible person. Re really, so your evaluation of human beings is every person who drives an old car is a a horrible person. Really? I mean, come on, isn't that what we're saying? You're so quiet. You're like, well, we don't wanna say. Yeah, but, 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 but that's what we're doing, isn't it? And, and see, because we shape our identity from the outside in, our clothing, our looks, our cars, our bank account, you know, we, we, we think our schooling, you know, if I have this degree, and it's so important. The Bible would say this, the Bible would say that's like living out of the natural man what the world's value system is. The world has a value system that says the bigger your bank account is, the more important a person you are. The Bible says, the Bible says, it's not how many servants you have serving you, but will you serve others? Jesus said that, didn't he? He said, I, will, you know, I didn't come to, to be served, I came to be a servant of all. So God flipped the whole identity thing, friends, inside out and upside down. It was a game changer. See, spiritual people are formed and shaped from the inside out. And so often I see Christian people do this. They take what they learned in the world, business or whatever, and you can do this if you are submitted to the king and he's changing you. You can allow him to take the things that he's given you in the world and he'll transform them into spiritual life for other people. That could be a skill that you have as a physician, you know, as a financial person. That could be any number of things that you could be, have reshaped. But, but I see a lot of Christians who don't allow God to reshape them at all. And then what they do is they take their skill and they just lay it over into Christianity and say, this is how the church should run, like a business. No, 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 no. No, that isn't what the Bible says. The Bible says that you're supposed to be spiritually minded, that you're supposed to be shaped from the inside out. 
that you're supposed to get your identity as a child of the king. So most of us, we don't do that in our culture. We're gonna be honest. I mean, when you start to surrender to the king, he starts to dismantle your old identity, whether it was from sports, your looks, whether it was from a, an, your education. God will start to say, you know, I know that's the most important thing to you, but it's not to me. Your education is not the most important thing to me. Your beauty is not the most important thing. Your ability to hit a ball with a bat or throw a round ball through a round circle is not very important to me. But how many of you know we think it is? We, we do. And people tell you it is. They're like, whoa, dude. I had this guy come up to me. This is a funny story. When I was 53, I was playing in a basketball game over in, um, at Rochester, 24 Hour Fitness, and this guy blocked my shot. He was a, this white kid and he could jump out of the gym. I was like, dude, where did you get that? You know, but he played at Fresno State. He could jump, I mean, that's what I remember about the guy. He just could jump out of the gym and he pinned me on the board. I was like, it was not good. Cause see, now you're aging and your identity. <laughs> Hello. And, and I was so mad when he did this to me. And, I mean, you know, I'm not a very competitive person, so you have to. <laughs> um, that's actually a place that God has tried to reshape my identity. But I, I got the ball in the next play going down the floor, and I dunked the ball. And I was 53. And I dunked in this game. And everybody in the gym just stopped and went, dude, how old are you? <laughs> I'm 53. And they went, no way, you are 53. You just dunked in again. This little Latin guy came up to me about a year later over at 24 Hour Fitness on Summit. I was in there just working out one day and he walks up to me and, and he goes, dude, you are my hero. I go, what are you talking about? I don't know who you are, what are you talking about? And he goes, I was in the gym at 24 Hour Fitness on Rochester when you dunked on a guy a year ago. That was amazing. You're my hero. And I'm like, okay, good, I'm your hero. Now listen, when people do that to you, how many of you know it's easy to shape your identity around sports? No, it is. Because it's like, it, that was a big deal for this guy. That you could like jump up and take a basketball and push it through a hole. No, really, come on, isn't that what this, at the end of the day, isn't that what we're saying? You can take a bat and hit a ball, a round thing with a stick, and if you can hit it 450 feet, then you get millions of dollars and you're famous. And we think you're amazing, you can do anything you want, you know, beat up your wife, get drunk, hurt other people, and you're gonna be okay. Come on, isn't that what we do in our culture? That's what we do. And why do we do that? Because we all wish we were that person. Because we think if we were that person, we would be a happy person. That's our identity, that's how we shape our identity. And everything in the Bible says that doesn't work. You'll fail in life if you live there. You get old like me. No, you do, and you can't play anymore, and guys that used to beat all the time just are whipping up on you and you're like, what happened? You got old. <laughs> you can't do what you used to do. You think in your head, hello? Come on, all you old people. You think in your head you're still in high school. <laughs> but you're not. Hello? You're not. See, this is so important. Now watch this. How you see yourself is who you are, a son or daughter of the king. You are royalty. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people. This is God talking about you if you're a Jesus follower. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
The New Living Translation puts this really in a very, it says this, once you had no identity, but now you are God's people in his possession. Once you had no identity, but now, listen, walk back through this just for a second with me. You are a chosen people, stop right there. Has it ever occurred to you if you're a Jesus follower that you didn't choose God, but God chose you? That God looked out over all of eternity and history and he said, you, stupid over there. Yeah, you that are in trouble all the time, you that are drunk, you that are like, I, I'm choosing you and I'm gonna change you. You'll never be the same once I choose you. Yeah, that's never be the same. You're a chosen people, but then listen to this word, a royal priesthood. Anybody here feel like royal priesthood? Because if you raise your hand, we're having an altar call for you right now. None of us feel like royal priesthood. Most of us don't feel like chosen people. A holy nation, are you kidding? God's special possession. Friends, I can't live according to how I feel. I have to live according to what God says about me. I don't want my identity to be shaped by a car or a house or clothes. Or I want my identity to be shaped by the king of the universe because he knows me better than I know myself. He knows who he created me to become, not who I live a lot of times being. He knows what I could be, not what I am. A holy nation, God's special possession. And if you are, you should declare the praise of the one who called you out of darkness into his light. You ought to. Some of you are so quiet, you're like, oh, oh, I'm, you know what, pastor? I'm a failure there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But let me help you with something. God is not finished with you yet. And if you will surrender to him, he will do the work to finish the work to change you forever. But you have to decide that every day. You have to choose every day. God, I want to be your possession today. I surrender to you. You're my king. You alone could make me into a holy nation, a chosen person, royal priesthood. Are you kidding? Once I wasn't a person. And man, I could go back in my life before I knew Jesus and I wasn't. I was deader than a doornail. I was scrambling around for everything I could do, like many of you, trying to fill the gaps so I felt okay inside. And then, and then, and then, Jesus. Man, once I crashed into him and he said, I love you. I love you. I remember I battled so much with rejection from my mom. And it was always, I wasn't good enough. Once my mom said to me, and, and, and I probably deserved it because I was an idiot. I was a, I mean, I was sniffing glue by the time I was 12. I was sniffing airplane glue out of a sock. I arrived my first house when I was 12 years old. You know, I remember F word and my mom when she took me back to military school when I was eight years old. And I look back and I go, oh my gosh, I was so jacked up. And you know, my mom said to me, I wish you were never born. I never wanted you. Your dad wanted you, but I never wanted you. He said that to me. Man, talk about shaping your identity. The words of somebody, you wanted their approval so bad. And it was, I wish you were never born. And I used to go to God with that all the time and go, what? Lord, this is, why did you give me a mom like that? Why did you? And you know, one day the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, you were not your mom's idea ever. You were always my idea. Is that good enough for you? Listen, you were not your parents' idea. You were God's idea. You were a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You, friends, are supernatural people, even when you don't feel like it. Listen, you are God's special possession. You are royalty not because of who you are, but because of who your father is. Your father is a king, the king of the universe. It's such an amazing picture. You know, we have five minutes left and I have six pages of notes done. <laughs> Do 
you know what happened to this though? Let me tell you the story really quick what happened to this. Because his image and his authority, they always go together. And if I don't live out of his image, I don't live out of his authority in my life. And that happened in Genesis chapter one, verse 26. It says this, that God said, let us make man, women, people in our image according to our likeness. So he created us in his image and it says, then let them have dominion over everything. Dominion is, uh, that's a kingdom word. It means to have rulership over. And he he goes through all of the things that that would look like. Then it says in verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over them. What what did that mean? It didn't mean destroy the things of God. Literally, it means take care of the things of God because God has entrusted you with his authority, listen, and his image is shaped in you. Are, you are the apple of God's eye, even if you don't feel like it, if you know Jesus. You are the apple of God's eye. Literally, he says this, I want you to have authority. I want you to have possibility, but that can't happen unless you submit to my authority. I cannot impart my authority to you when you don't submit to me. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So a lot of us, we live like this all the time. I'm the king of my life. You know, I'll do it my way. I'm in a driver's seat. I'm large and in charge. Everybody knows who I am. And I love Jesus. No, 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 no. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. You can't do all of that and disobey God and say, you're all good. It's not all good. You have to be honest and say, you're not good with God. It's not good. You might be a child of the king, but you are not walking in a manner worthy of your calling, as Paul would say. Paul said, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. What does that mean? The word is peripateo in Greek. It literally means to live out your life. Take each step, each decision, each part of your journey every day should reflect what? It should reflect that you are the child of a king. You're a child of a king. And so what, what, what happened in this whole thing? God gave us dominion, he put his image in us, and then something tremendously difficult, life-changing happened. What, what happened? Genesis 3.16 tells us that people walked away from God. We rebelled, and we've been rebelling ever since. When you rebel, you gotta figure this out. You lose authority, and you don't look like your father wants you to look. You lose his image. You lose his image, you lose dominion that he gave to you, you lose authority, you lose possibility in this life. The more you submit to God, the more you begin to reflect God, and the more you operate in the authority of God. That's just how this goes. Now, what does that mean? Well, at the beginning of time, God right away said, listen, I'm gonna repair this. I'm gonna restore this. I'm gonna put this back together. That's why Jesus died on the cross, is that right? But, 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 but hold it, the gospel of the kingdom, there's good news, Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you so you can surrender to your king. You can be remade in his image. You can operate in his authority. That's the picture in the Bible. Not that you can go off wild and do whatever you want. The, the Bible says literally you have freedom. God has set you free, but use your freedom to bring life to other people. It's not about you. It's about you and him touching other people. So when you start to see the picture and you see that clearly, I mean, the enemy came in, the serpent, we say in, the, in Genesis chapter three, and clearly Revelation 12, nine says, the great dragon was hurled down to earth, the ancient serpent that is called the devil or Satan. So clearly we know this, the one that was in the garden was Satan. It was hell. And hell wanted to steal the authority that God gave to people. Did that happen? Yes. Clearly in scripture, the enemy took the authority. And Jesus died, the Bible says, to get the authority back. The authority of the king and the kingdom, the dominion, the possibility that God wants to give to you. We gave it up in the garden and Jesus gave it back at the cross. And that, friends, is good news. Now, the first person that you actually see operate in this 
And this is point number two in your little outline with five minutes left, you know, let's see, was David. David's a great picture of the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, I said this to you a couple weeks ago, but there's no real picture in the Old Testament of the kingdom of God. There's just a picture of a king and the people. And so David, though, was the first person to actually operate like he was part of the kingdom. I mean, because he was so much like the father, it would make sense that he would be a kingdom guy. The Bible says that David was a man after God's heart. And so what you see though with David is a whole thing of image that we were talking about. David saw himself as a warrior. You remember the first person that David ever killed? Who was it? Come on. Some of y'all need to watch the cartoons more. We got some people in the front row, they knew. It was Goliath the giant, right? David killed Goliath. And that was the beginning of shaping David's image as a what? A warrior. He was a warrior. And that's how he saw himself. But when he became intimate with God, God started to return him into a worshiper. That he would become a worshiper, not just a warrior. And so you have this whole battle in David's life of David trying to serve God. And then David crashed and burned, didn't he? Hello? Those of you who read your Bible, if you don't, he had an affair with a lady named Bathsheba. And what, what happened to David? Was he still the king after that? Yes, he was. Did he, have the still, did he, did he have, still have the same authority that he had had before? No, he didn't. Why? Because he disobeyed the king. And you can see David's last years in his family's life, in his own life, in the kingdom called Israel, in their life, everything started to fragment and break down under David's watch. David's own family completely imploded. David was, in fact, a very poor father. And so when you look at this, you're like, what happened? What happened is he moved out from underneath the rulership of the king. And when you do that, you always end up in what? Trouble, you always end up in trouble. And some of you live there right now, you're out from underneath the authority of the king, and you're like, why is my life so jacked up? Because you need to surrender to the king. You're a chosen person, a royal priesthood. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. So so watch this. David made this statement near the end of his life. It was amazing. If you got a Bible, an iPad, a phone, turn to 1 Chronicles 29.10. I want to read this to you because this is David trying to get it right at the end of his life. It says in verse 10, 1 Chronicles 29, David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heaven and on the earth is yours. So hold it, that is an identity statement, is it not? David recognized God owns what? Everything. Everything. God owns everything, that's what David just said. Everything that's in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, David says, is the dominion, that means the authority, the power, the possibility, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all, because you're the king. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. And in your hand is power and might. And it lies in your hand to make somebody great and to strengthen everybody. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise you for your glorious name. So here's a guy who is really making this declaration. What is it? You're, the, you're king, you're God, and I'm what? Not. I'm not God. I'm not king. You are. And it lies in your hand to make everybody great. Whoa, that's an incredible statement, friends. Did you know God could make you great? (laughs) You're like, yes. Yes, I could be the greatest mouse in the world, yes. No, 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 God can make you great in his sight. No, 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 when I say great, you're like, bing, 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 bing. You're like, oh, I'm gonna be like Michael Jordan, the shoes are gonna be named after me. yeah, I mean, no, 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 no. That's not great in the kingdom of God, right? Great in the kingdom of God is a servant of all, and then God honors and exalts you and blesses you and increases your possibility that you can never have. So, so David got all of this for He's like, listen, 
it lies in your hand to make people great, people that submit to the king. But, listen to verse 14, who am I? And who are all of us as a people that we should be able to offer as generously as this for you? So they were trying to build a temple and there was an offering coming in. And David's like, we don't have anything. You have everything. For all things come from you. And from your hand, we have given you. So we are just sojourners before you and tenants. So our job is, he went right back to like the beginning and he said, our job is just to be here and take care of your place as all of our fathers were. And our days on earth are just like a shadow. Without you, there's no hope. Oh Lord, our God, all of this abundance we have provided to build your house from your, all of it for your holy name, it is from your hand and it is yours alone. Since I know, oh my God, that you try the heart and you delight in uprightness, I, in the integrity of my heart, have willingly offered everything back to you. So now with joy, I've seen your people who are present here make their offerings willingly to you. So you know what he's just said? We understand that you're God and we are happy to be in your kingdom. That's what David just said. We are happy to be part of who you are. So, 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 so what does it mean? It means, listen, how does God give you authority? You know how? He gives you, he gives you favor you don't deserve in places you should never have it. He opens doors for you can never open for yourself. He shows himself at the wildest times and places that you would never expect him to show up. So David literally said this, it's not riches and honor, he said, that I need to have my identity. He said, my identity comes completely from you, not my stuff. My identity is from you. So if you're gonna learn to be godly, friends, you're gonna submit to the king, you gotta figure this out. You've got to learn to forgive because God is always what? Forgiving. God is forgiving. And then there's another word. They both go together. Give and forgive. God is generous. He cares for you. He gives, he gave his only son for your life. So here's the question. Are you generous? Well, pastor, really? No, 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 no. No, no, you can need to ask yourself hard questions. Are you generous? Do you offer willingly to God? Are you like, God, I, whatever I have is yours. I love you, Father. Do with me whatever you want. Take my time, my talent, my resources, whatever you want, I'm in 100%. I, I believe in you and I trust you. I trust you that you'll do the right thing with me. So watch this. How do you get there? I know some of you are sitting there going, that is impossible. Well, it's impossible if your whole identity is made up on things on the earth, all your stuff and all of your, all, all, all the things around you. The king and the kingdom, we said this last week, move quietly and slowly. And so you have to figure this out with God. We covered two stories last week out of Matthew 13. And they're really important stories about God building you. It's one about a seed, a mustard seed, that grows into a big tree, and one about leaven that permeates the bread. And both of these things happen really slow and very quiet. You know what's amazing about trees when they start bearing fruit? They never go, ah! <laughs> I got lemon trees in my yard, I never hear them make any noise. They just keep making fruit, but it's not, <laughs> you know, it's not hard for a tree to make fruit. Do you know that? It's natural. It's natural. It just should happen. That's what's supposed to happen in you, friends. It's not hard when you submit to the king for him to start to change you from the inside out. It just happens. You don't even know it's happening. People around you usually see it's happening before you see it's happening. But you start to bear fruit, the Bible says. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, you bear fruit. So what does it mean? It means this, you submit to God. You do it quietly. You, Luke 13, 21 says this, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It's like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of the meal and in, in the bread until it was all leaven. Literally, it's a spirit of God hidden inside your heart. You surrender to God. God does all the work. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work 
for his good pleasure, the book of Philippians says. God is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God will bring to completion whatever he begins in you. So here's the question for you. Are you letting God do anything in you? Hello, are you still alive out there? I know you're ready to like, let's have communion, go to Lucille's, Pastor Dan, it's Father's Day, get us out of here, fast. Okay, I'll get you out of here right now. Are you letting God do anything in you? Are you allowing him to be your king? Listen to Jesus and we're done here. Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one, a great picture of what God wants to do in you to change you. It's Jesus' baptism. Verse nine and 10 says, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, now listen, immediately, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening up and a spirit like a dove descended upon him and a voice came out of the heavens and said, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Do you know three things just happen there that are supposed to happen in your life? If you surrender to God, you will begin to receive revelation. God's spirit will begin to speak to you. It says the heavens open up, that God will bring insight to you you could never have in circumstances, situations, in his word. Some of you read the Bible and you're like, I can't do this, I don't understand anything. You need to open to the power of the spirit and allow God to help you read the word. Some of you, bless your heart, you are here today and you are doing your very best to stay awake and you are dying. And you wanna know why you're dying? Because you're not spiritually minded. No, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. Well, maybe you worked all night last night too. I, I don't know. But some of you, you're just not spiritually minded. And you need to open up and invite the Holy Spirit to change your thinking. You don't have to change yourself. Just tell God, listen, I don't get this stuff. But I understand there's a spiritual world and I'm really not functioning in it and I wanna open up to it. So Holy Spirit, would you touch me? Jesus received revelation. Second thing he received, listen, he received identity. He said, you are my what? My son. You are my son. And he received the power of the Spirit. If Jesus needed revelation, identity, and the power of the Spirit, how much more do you need that? How much more do I need that? And what happened as soon as Jesus went out into the wilderness and got tempted by the enemy? What did the enemy say to him? If you are the son of God, do this. Do you know what that was about? Identity. Are you in the kingdom? And Jesus is like, I'm the son of God, yeah. No, 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 if you are, then you need to do this. Jesus, no, I don't have to do anything. I already know who I am. Do you know who you are? You are a royal priesthood, God's chosen people, a special possession. That's what the Bible says you are. That's an amazing picture. Let's pray and take communion together. Father, we wanna come right now. Say thank you, God, for loving us the way that you do. Thank you, Father, that you, Lord, set identity before people who submit themselves to you. So we pray, Father, that we would allow you to work in us deeply. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you don't have, if you're in Upland, we're gonna let you go to do communion right now. And um, if you're here in the worship center, I want to invite you to raise your hand. If you don't have communion, we'll hand it out to you. Is there anybody over here who doesn't have communion? Right up here in the front. Up in the front, up here. Anybody over here? Anybody over here? If you don't have communion, wave your hand so we can hand it out to you and we'll get started here. You know, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 6, that you have a taste of the age to come. Those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the power of the Holy Spirit have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come. The power of the age to come. The Holy Spirit working in you, friends, is a picture of the kingdom of God and the power of the age to come. Let's take the bread together. Father, we wanna to come to you right now and say thank you, God, that you wanna transform us. 
And we know, Father, that that begins in our head, how we think. You said in Romans 12, you want to transform our thoughts by renewing our mind, our identity, that we would understand we are royal people, a chosen people, royal priesthood. Father, thank you for the cross. You restored the kingdom through the cross. So I pray for us that you would restore our identity. We would look and live like Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Take and eat in Jesus' name. Father, you took the cup, and that same night, you said it was your blood that would forgive us, that would heal us, redeem us, and restore us. And I pray for people that are here right now that are not spiritually minded, that are struggling, Father, just with a whole journey, that they would lay their heart down before you. You know them better than they know themselves, that they would trust you, Father, not their feelings, and they would invite you, Holy Spirit, to begin to change their identity. Thank you, Lord, that you gave up your life to restore our lives. Thank you, Father, for the blood. Take and drink in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to stand together with me if you would. You can drop your cups on the way out, but I want you to bow your heads for just a minute. And I wanna leave you with a couple of thoughts. Kingdom living begins with kingdom thinking. Romans 12, two says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 8, 6 6 says that the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. 1 Peter 4, 1 says, therefore, since Christ suffered for you in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. Friends, it takes a miracle to bring our minds into a place you can receive the heart of God, the thoughts of God, the kingdom of God. You may not feel like royalty, but friends, don't trust your feelings. Trust your Father's word. He has spoken life over you, but you have to receive that. You've been adopted, the Bible says, as a child of the king, a co-heir with Christ. You have a royal inheritance. Father, we come and we bow our hearts down before you today. And I pray for people that are struggling, God, to forgive other people, people that are stuck in selfishness. Generosity is something they can't even conceive of, Father, because so much of their identity is shaped around their money, their bank account, their stuff. Father, people that are bitter, angry, and unforgiving, they can't conceive of being free. That today, Lord, you would break through and you would speak to them that you have the healing They need the kingdom of God and the healing of God come hand in hand. So Father, we thank you that you are our king and you are our healer. Thank you, Father. Everybody said amen. Amen. If you need prayer, make your way down to the front, would you? And um, we'll have a team of people that pray for you. God bless you. Happy Father's Day. Well, wasn't that a great message? You know, I say this all the time, but our hope here is that you wouldn't just receive information, but that you would experience transformation. And so we hope that you were transformed and challenged and encouraged by today's message. Like we mentioned, if you want to find out more ways to get connected to Water of Life, make sure you check out our website, wateroflifecc.org. But other than that, we love you guys. We hope you have a great week, and we can't wait to see you next week at Water of Life.